flying over London, and it really doesn't make a lot of damage. However, it does create panic, and there's people that respond to this. Oh my God, the Germans are over Coventry or wherever, and this is gonna create some local panic. But in terms of its effect on war production and on Great Britain itself, it cost Great Britain about a half day's worth of World War I expenses in terms of repairing the damage. It's not a lot, okay? And the Brits will try to do some strategic bombing uh, in response to the Germans, but it's really what we would call today operational level, hitting rail lines just behind the front lines or a depot or a supply dump just behind the front lines. So it's not really strategic in the terms that we would understand today. So during the interwar years, after we've had this quagmire of four years, 11 million men killed, and the horror of trench warfare on the Western Front, there's a lot of theorists that go, we've got these funny things called airplanes, and they can go far, and they can go deep. And instead of fighting for four years on the front, slogging it out, what if I went deep and hit the enemy where they're making the sinews of war? Tanks and guns and bullets and all those things you need to put a military force in the field. So this rather elegant idea of hitting the production centers of your enemy has a distinct attractiveness to it because now you're not sending millions of men over the top. And you can avoid that trench warfare. And there are those that buy this idea and there are those that do not. The Americans and the British will subscribe to this idea of strategic bombardment. And in the U.S. Army Air Forces during the interwar year at the Air Corps Tactical School in Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, where they're wearing itchy woolen uniforms and they're down south where it's humid, okay, they come with this idea of strategic bombardment and going long, the Air Force version of it, the U.S. Air Force version of it. And what the Air Force comes up with this idea of precision bombardment. This idea is we as Americans, we don't kill people. We will, but the thing is we hit factories, we hit targets, we bomb things, not people specifically. So there's a humanitarian tone in this American approach to strategic bombardment. We'll develop things like the Norton bomb site that has this great reputation of being able to put bombs in a pickle barrel. Yes, that's exaggerated, but we subscribe to this idea of being able to hit pinpoint targets, avoiding hitting the school, but being able to hit the factory. And so the Air Force will go into the war with this as its basic precept. And so this idea that there are vital centers within a country itself that you can hit that will force it to collapse, that will force it to capitulate in terms of warfare and production, and we can identify those things. They do, in fact, exist. And if you look at some of the Air Corps Tactical School lesson plans during the interwar years, they actually do mock studies of New York City. What could we hit in New York City to shut that city down? And they'll come up with ideas like power plants, sewage factories, waste disposal areas, transportation networks, major roads, major intersections or thoroughfares. There's a number of these points that we could hit that would force that city to stop functioning as a city itself. The same thing, they, under, they think that, yep, these things are vulnerable to bombing. We can actually see these things and drop bombs on them and hit them with a level of accuracy. Okay. Now, that makes really good sense when you're flying over Texas or Southern California where the air is clear, air visibility unlimited. If anybody here has been to Europe during the winter, or summer or spring for that matter, there's not a lot of clear skies. For any one area of Germany, there are 104 days of clear weather out of 364 days. There's about 104 days of clear weather. So that means the other two thirds of the time, you're flying over a cloud bank or an undercast and you can't see the target. But our assumption is that we can, okay? The other thing is here, bombers, we think, can always get through. There's the, the great quote from uh, uh, the British that uh, the bomber will always get through. And the Army Air Corps subscribes to this idea because we're gonna put this thing called the B-17, the Flying Fortress, right? It's got 10 machine guns, a crew of 10, and it can continue to fly through a flak barrage because in the First World War, only about 3% of British losses were of aircraft were from anti-aircraft fire. For the Germans, it was even less. 
So we buy into this idea that we'll always be able to keep our aircraft going towards a target and nothing can stop them. But if we have all this defensive armament and enemy fighters come after us, we'll be able to defend ourselves. Again, this is an underlying precept of the American uh, concepts here. And again, if we hit these targets enough, eventually it will the enemy's uh, industrial capacity and her will to fight will collapse. That's how we enter the Second World War in our doctrinal approach to strategic bombing. Okay, but there's a little bit of a there's lots of problems with it, but there's one specific problem that's going to address uh, what we're going to talk about today. In 1942, after America uh, gets in the war, they're going to publish what's called the Air War Planning Document. And this will serve as a blueprint for what the Army Air Forces is going to look like during the Second World War. Okay? And they're going to identify what the target sets need to look like. We're going to look at uh, hitting the Luftwaffe itself, hitting the submarine construction, and German war making capabilities overall. In July 1941, FDR is quite the uh, politician. He needs to get America going on a war footing, but he can't claim that we're on a war footing yet. He has to walk this fine line. But in July 1941, he realizes, you know, the writing's on the wall, even though we can't do anything about it. And he puts in a request to the War Department to say, what would our material requirements be if a war was to happen? In August 1941, a bunch of gentlemen in D.C. will put together what's called Air War Planning Document Number 1 that will lay out the framework for what the U.S. combined bomber effort will look like. It's going to call for a three-fold increase in the size of the Army Air Forces. In June 1938, the U.S. Army Air Force is about 20,000 guys, or 11,000 percent, excuse me, 11 percent of the Army. By 1944, it will be 2.4 million men, or about 33 percent of the Army. It's going to grow exponentially. Uh, in 1940, the U.S. made 6,000 aircraft total. By 1944, she's going to be producing 96,000 aircraft, a 16% or 16-fold uh, increase in aircraft production. Air War Planning Document 1 lays the foundation for the growth of the Army Air Force as we know it during the Second World War. It'll get modified a year later in AWPD 42, but the basic premise will still remain. And what they're going to say is, look, if we build our air forces up and we're at full strength, if we go at the Germans for six months at full strength, that should be enough time to capitulate the German war economy, to drop it to its knees. Problem is, it doesn't turn out that way. Okay? We have a significant missing element, and that's something here that uh, everybody knows, that sexy looking airplane right there, the P-51D version. And Major General Haywood Hans was one of the chief planners of air war planning document number one. And this is his quote. Now remember, the bomber will always get through. I don't need fighters. There's a requirement for that because my B-17 has enough guns on it, has enough range, and it can get there. So it's not going to be a problem. Thing is, that doesn't happen. The Luftwaffe is able to pierce American defensive positions within the uh, bomber streams themselves, and they're decimating U.S. bombers. Nobody thinks prior to the war that you can build a fighter that can travel 600, 700 miles, have enough speed, firepower, and maneuverability that can go mano on mano with an enemy fighter. Most of your planes that have ranges over a thousand miles have two engines, they have fuel tanks, and they're big and they're heavy. And so if you remember the movie Top Gun where they're doing all that kind of stuff, you can't do that. In 1940, 1941, that is considered an engineering impossibility. You can't do it. So the bombers, again, you have all this defensive position or these defensive uh, uh, guns on your aircraft, you don't need the fighters. Plus, we can't make them anyway. Okay. We're going to find out later on that A, yes, you can make them, and B, yes, it is a requirement, which is what operation argument is largely about. 
They're going to find out in autumn of 1943 that 20% of the bombers are hit, or bombs are landing within 1,000 feet of the target itself. It's called the circular aerial probable. When you have fighter escort, about 40% of your bombs are landing within your circular aerial probable. And by the end of the war, about 50% of them are hitting within their circular aerial probable. So there's a correlation here between having some defense in terms of fighter protection and bombing accuracy. So the first time they start doing their bombing missions, a lot of B-17s are doing uh, evasive maneuvers over the target. Of course, if you're the bombardier and you're trying to hit a target and the plane's moving, it's very difficult to hit your, your given target, okay? And so they have to reel back and say, once you go down your initial run, on the bomb run, you have to stay straight and level. And of course, the Germans know this. So if the plane is flying straight and level, he's an easy target. So there's this vulnerability of these bombers, not only as they're flying there, but more importantly, when they're on the bomb run. And not only when they're on the bomb run, not only are the fighters a problem, but there's also another problem, flak. German anti-aircraft guns, 88 millimeters, I can shoot as high as 40,000 feet, optimally at 20,000 feet. Well, guess what? Where do B-17s fly? 20,000 feet, optimally. And so the Germans know what the, the main targets are, so where were they set up a flak box? Right around the initial point where the bombers are making their run. So the fighters can come in, shoot up the bombers, and then they know where the flak box is, the German fighters will peel off, and of course the bombers will have to fly into the flak box, fly through that, bomb their target, and then on the way home, they get fighters again. And they'll be waiting. Later on in the war, the Germans get desperate, they'll actually fly into their own flak boxes and go after the bombers as well. I would not advocate that, but that's what they do because they're getting desperate. This is that fighter escort uh, range that I was talking about here. Here we're talking about P-38s and P-51s. When the war first starts, or the strategic bombing offensive first starts, this fighter escort can only take B-17s about as far as Antwerp and Amsterdam with a Spitfire or a P-47. Eventually, we're going to discover the, the concept of droppable fuel tanks or disposable fuel tanks, and that will take P-47s probably about as far as Frankfurt. And the Germans, again, they're going to know this. So what do they do? They stay away until the fighters peel off, and then they jump in on the bomber. It isn't until the P-51 shows up with long-range fuel tanks, you can see, and she can go all the way to Vienna, or about uh, 600, 700 miles, depending on the uh, aerial conditions. And so now you can actually escort a bomber to and from the target. This makes a big difference in the air war. If P-51 does not show up in any significant numbers, the first squadron shows up in December 1943. They're not gonna be enforced really until 1944. So for the most part, you're dealing with P-47s with the underwing fuel tanks as P-51s start coming into the theater. Now, early loss rates here for the 8th Air Force during this time, about 8% one year. You go, that's not bad. 8% of the bombing force? Heck, I got a good chance of, of surviving. Really? A normal tour in the 8th Air Force in 1943 is 25 missions. Now, I'm no mathematician, which is why I became a history major, okay? But think about this. If you're having an 8% loss rate on every mission, now start doing the math. Somewhere around mission 10 to 12, statistically, you're not gonna make your full complement of 25 missions. And the guys that are flying in the Army Air Force during the Second World War are kind of your smarter than average bear guys. They usually have maybe a year or two or college maybe, but they can do math, navigation, engineering. These are pretty smart guys that are flying these aircraft. And they can figure this out relatively quickly, that we're not gonna survive these tours. In a survey of, of 2,000 men in the 8th Air Force, only 599 lived uh, to finish 25 missions. About 25% will survive their mission tours unscathed, meaning they don't get a purple heart, they didn't get hit or they didn't disappear or get shot down. In 19, by, uh, 1944, about 38% of all bombers returning have some kind of battle damage uh, on them. And you can see here some of the numbers of 73% uh, of airmen in 1942 failed to complete their tours of duty. 
some more pictures of the damage incurred. The 8th Air Force, during the Second World War, will lose about 26,000 men killed. Okay? As United States Marine, okay, I have to turn my card in as a result of this, the Marine Corps will lose less than 20,000 Marines in the Pacific War. The 8th Air Force itself loses more airmen than the Marine Corps loses during the Second World War. Most people don't realize that. The slaughter that's going on here over the air war in Europe. In one particular bomb group, the 100th Bomb Group, on a raid to Munster, Germany, in a short span of 12 minutes, they will lose 12 of 13 bombers. And you can see it there, they talk about they lost 137 of 140 flying officers in the 100th bomb group. It gets nicknamed the Bloody 100. Matter of fact, there's a great story of a new pilot who shows up in England and he's assigned to the 8th Air Force and they look on the board to see where, what uh, bomb group they're gonna go to, what bomb division, and there's a pilot in the corner and he's crying. And his friend says to him, you know, what's wrong, why are you crying? He goes, because I've been assigned to the 100th bomb group. But the 100th Bomb Group, in terms of aggregate, doesn't suffer any worse than any other divisions, but it sh gives you a picture of the losses that these men are facing every day. Remember, I talked about it's not just fighters, it's also flak. This is the Schweinfurt Raid in 1943. By 1944, the Germans will have 1.1 million people in the flak arm. Much of German armament production is going into artillery, i.e. 88 millimeters, or the ammunition itself for anti-aircraft defense. And think about the men who are flying these bombers in 1943 and 1945. Most of them are 20, 21 years old, 22, you're an old man. Like Pappy Boynton was 24 and they referred to him as Pappy. Seriously. These guys are 21 years old, they're flying missions every other day or every three or four days. Their attrition rates are around 10%. You have to think about what that does to you psychologically. It's weighing on these men. And the most things that they complain about, fighters you can shoot at, you can see them, you can deal with at least with the machine guns you have. The flak, there's nothing you can do about it. You gotta fly through it. And this drives the men crazy. This is the one thing, or this is the thing that causes the most anxiety with these crews. One chief, uh, uh, one uh, air crew chief says, flat scored the hell out of me. When it burst around us, I stood on my top turret and cringed and shivered. And during the uh, combined bomber offensive, they will establish what's called flak farms, where they will send air crewmen for a week or two to kind of calm themselves down before we put them back into a bomber and fly them off again. There aren't a lot of uh, uh, men who refuse to fly. There are some cases of it, but surprisingly few do. Uh, there are no officers that are court-martialed. There is an enlisted man who gets court-martialed for not flying, but no officers are court-martialed. Usually they are just sent back to the United States and giving a training command assignment. Ex they try to remove these guys as expeditiously as possible out of the slaughters because they don't want that virus, my, my word, not theirs, infecting the other officers. Okay. So this is what the 8th Air Force is up against. Now, when the 8th Air Force first starts this bombing campaign, the general in charge is a guy by the name of Ira Aker. And Ira Aker is really good friends with his boss back in Washington, who's the chief of staff of the Army Air Force, Half Arnold. Matter of fact, Aker is like his protege. They write books together, they write articles together, and when the 8th Bomber Command starts its missions, Aker's in charge. Well, 1943 is not working out too well for the U.S. Army Air Forces. Half Arnold is really concerned about showing that air power really works and making a statement for an independent U.S. Air Force. And when he's not seeing the results that he wants, he's writing a letter to his subordinate saying, what the hell's the problem? Aker will respond back in a letter, and the quote is, I am not some horse to be ridden with spurs. Well, Half 
just about had enough of it. And in December 1943, he does the Donald Trump thing and he says, you're fired. It's not what he tells him. He says, you're being promoted. We're going to move you to the 15th Air Force in, uh, or the Mediterranean Air Forces. And you're going to be in charge of all those air forces down in North Africa and in Italy. Of course, Anchor knows that this is not a promotion. Okay? And what, he do what Arnold does is he brings in Jimmy Doolittle to replace uh, Ira Anchor as the 8th uh, Air Force <coughs> commander. And he's going to bring in a guy by the name of Carl Spatz. And Spatz is going to serve as U.S. Strategic Air Forces commander, meaning he's going to ride herd over the 15th Air Force, which flies out of Italy, and the 8th Air Force that flies out of England. And it's his job to coordinate both of these strategic air forces uh, in their efforts. Spots gets moved up because he's used to working with Ike in the Mediterranean, and they're going to say, well, Ike knows him, Ike likes him, so he's going to go over to England. They try to tell Anchor that as well. Now, this is Ike's air guy. So, you know, okay, you're getting a promotion, but this is the guy who wanted to work with Ike. Again, Anchor knows that this is a lie, but he lives with it. Okay. And when these gentlemen take over in January 1944, Doolittle is going to realize there's a problem here. I have all the toys and assets that I need to conduct this mission, but our doctrine is wrong. And he's going to take about a month to think about this thing. And Spots is tasked with a very difficult mission. Because what happens 70 years tomorrow? D-Day. Hey, Spots, guess what? Your job is to give me air supremacy, or air superiority, excuse me, for the cross-channel invasion in six months. Well, look at what's been happening in 1943 with the bomber. And now in six months, you need to own the air before we cross the channel. That's your job. Okay, boss, got it. When Doolittle shows up and he sees what the losses are between the fighters and the bombers, he's going to direct a change in fighter doctrine. He gets a new fighter, 8th Fighter Command uh, commander by the name of William Kepner, and he goes and he visits Kepner one day, and Kepner has a sign in his office. And the sign says, the fighter's mission is to bring home the bombers. protect them, so forth. And Doolittle looks at it and he goes, where'd that come from? He says, it was here when I showed up. And he says, take it down. Put one up that says, the 8th Air Force fighter's mission is to kill the Luftwaffe. <coughs> Doolittle believes, and rightly so, that protecting bombers and staying with them as they escort them to their targets makes the fighters targets targets themselves, what those fighters need to do is go after the Luftwaffe, go after those fighters and have what they call ultimate pursuit. Prior to 1944, the Air Force manual on uh, air fighting stipulated that you're supposed to stay with the bombers to protect them. But when Doolittle institutes the idea of ultimate pursuit, what he's saying is, you fighter guys, you break off and go kill the Luftwaffe. Go attack their fighters that are in the air and go after their fighters that are on the ground. Go on the offense as opposed to staying defensively. Now, you can imagine if you're a bomber crew, this probably doesn't sit too well with you. But if you're a fighter pilot, oh yeah, game on. And in February of 1944, during the big week, you're going to see this comprehensive change in American fighter doctrine and execution of fighter missions. They are going to go after the Luftwaffe and try to kill them both in the air and on the ground. So you're turning the doctrine on its head during this time under Doolittle himself. Operation Argument, which this whole thing I'm leading up to, I finally got here, okay? This idea was we're going to attack not only the Luftwaffe but the German air industry itself, the air bases, the facilities that produce aircraft, and so we're going to do this for a whole week just focusing on the Luftwaffe. The problem is with the Germans. They build an army to take back Alsace, Lorraine, and take Poland, but what they don't build an army or an air force for is a long duration war. And we're going to go after that capability. You can produce airplanes, but one thing you can't mass produce pilots. 
we kill a lot of pilots, guess what? The Germans can't maintain that same operational tempo. So we're going to bring them out, we're going to fight them, and by night the Brits are going to help us out with the round-the-clock bomb, and they're going to hit many of the same targets that we hit during the day. Of course, the Brits do it area bombardment, where we do it precision. We call it precision, although it's far from it. We're just looking for some good weather, and the meteorologists at the time, us, we don't have satellites, we think we're going to have high pressure over Germany around the 19th and 20th of February, but we don't know that for sure. But again, you have to get the force going and pots and airplanes. And on the 19th of February, Spot says, okay, let's go, because we think we're going to have high pressure. So on the 20th of February, 1944, we launch our first missions uh, for the big week. And the targets themselves are going to be aircraft factories, and the bases themselves within Germany. And again, as we're bombing the bases and the factories, we're also going to be fighting the Luftwaffe with our fighters in the air. We're going to hit targets like Leipzig, where there's an ME-109 assembly factory, Bernburg, which produces JU-88 uh, night fighters or, uh, or uh, uh, medium bombers, Halberstadt, which is a wing factory for the Luftwaffe, Regensburg, which has a, a ME-109 assembly and a component factory, Gotha, Germany, that has a final assembly for the Luftwaffe, Augsburg, and Brunswick, which helped complete ME-110s, which are night fighters for the German Luftwaffe. On that first day, we're going to send over 1,000 bombers and 800 fighters to Germany. We're going to penetrate with two different forces, a north force and a southern or a central force to help split the Luftwaffe fighters so they can't mass on one given air force as it's going. And remember now, our fighters are going after the Luftwaffe in mass. To give you a harbinger for what happens during this first day, uh, there's one German ME-110 squadron, that's a, a, a dual engine uh, day fighter, long range fighter. They're gonna have 13 planes take off and they're gonna rendezvous with three more aircraft at a later spot. By the time that three more aircraft get to the rendezvous spot, 11 of the 13 original flight is already shot down. And once the Americans shoot down those 11, they go after the German airfield where those ME-110s took off and destroy another nine aircraft on the ground. So they're changing the game on the Luftwaffe during the fight. And that's just on day one. Uh, you got some problems. Again, we have an undercast problem or bad weather. And we're going to have to bomb by H2X is a er very early radar that can paint the ground. Again, it's rudimentary radar. You can see a city of about 500,000 people, and that's about it. Other than that, it's, it's kind of useless. But we're going to use it because it's a precision bombing instrument. But we're going to call it a precision bombing instrument. Okay? And you can see here, they do a, a pretty good job on this day. Uh, over Brunswick, the problem is when they're using their H2X, they miss the factory, but they hit the city. So, oops, sorry. And one of the problems you have with strategic bombing, too, is you may hit your target. Hey, that's great. But the problem is, what are you really trying to go after? The machinery that's in the factory. And a lot of times, I'll knock down the four walls, but guess what's still there working? The lathe. So the guy may be working outside now, but he's still producing hoovilator valves for ME-109s. But if you're the intelligence guy and you're looking at the battle damage assessment, that target's been destroyed. Well, the lathe is still working. And this happens a lot. We don't know that at the time. We think since we hit the target, we hit the, the building, it must be out of commission. Not necessarily the case. We're going to find this out a lot as the war goes on. Um, <clears throat> you can see here, they're gonna, we're going to lose about uh, 21 bombers on this day. And we're going to claim 61 Germans. We will inflate our kill figures horrendously. And here's one of the reasons why. Think about a bomber formation. You're flying along at 1,000, 20,000 feet, and any 109 flies through your formation. And what do all your gunners do? They shoot at it, right? Well, let's say it gets hit, it catches on fire. Who claims that kill? Everybody. Yeah, I shot him, I shot him, I shot him, I shot him. So maybe they got four claims for, for one kill. There are a couple of medals honor, honors that are given out that I think that it's important to talk about the elements in which these gentlemen are flying because it, it's very important. Uh, First Lieutenant William Lawley is flying to the, on the Leipzig Ring. This is his 10th mission. 
Um, he's with the 305th Bomb Group, and he's attacked by 12 fighters. Uh, eight of his crewmen are hit. One engine is on fire. Uh, and 109 comes in and attacks the front of the bomber, which is the preferred method by the Germans. Uh, as the 20 millimeter cannons help splinter the uh, windshield, it kills his pilot, uh, takes off half of his face. As the pilot dies, he, his weight of his body leans forward on the yoke, the control yoke of the aircraft. The aircraft takes a 10,000 foot dive. Lolly is trying to fly the airplane as the pilot and push his dead compatriot off of the yoke while trying to fly the airplane. He's able to get the aircraft level at around 10,000 feet. He's able to shut down the one engine that is on fire, and he tells his crewmen to all bail out. Most of these men cannot bail out because they're already wounded. Now, Lolly was also injured, although not um, lethally, uh, in that initial assault by those 109. The windshield is cracked. Now, he's flying in February in Europe, and he's at about 10,000 feet, and he's flying at about 150 knots, and the windscreen is blown out. So imagine where, what he's doing with the relative wind coming through his cockpit, trying to stay awake. The navigator comes up and keeps talking to him to keep him awake so he doesn't pass out from his blood loss and continue to fly the airplane. He flies five hours all the way back to uh, Great Britain. He finds a Canadian fighter base on the coast of Great Britain and he crash lands the aircraft. All the men on the aircraft live, some of them are crippled and won't walk again. But he gets these men home. Years later, when one of his uh, crewmen see him at a reunion, uh, his, uh, one of his door gunners, a guy by the name of Raph Braswell, will look at Lolly's hands and say, they're the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life because they saved my life. On the same day, you're gonna have another interesting incident a B-17 called 10 horsepower, and it's the uh, aircraft you see on the very uh, top uh, there. A 109 strafes it from the, from the very front, kills the pilot, shoots off again half of his face, decapitates the co-pilot. The top gunner comes down and sees what's happening. He tries to straighten the aircraft out. The navigator, uh, who is Lieutenant Walter Trumpier, comes in and starts to fly the airplane. The ball turret gunner, a guy by the name of Archie Matthews, has some flight training. He will actually sit in the, they'll remove the uh, co-pilot out because his head is gone. They think the pilot is maybe still gonna live, so they don't wanna move him. Get the co-pilot out, Matthews sits in the pilot seat, or the co-pilot seat and flies the aircraft while Trumpeteer, uh, goes ahead and uh, navigates a new route home. After he determines the heading, he comes back into the cockpit, and because, again, the noise from the wind coming into the smashed windshield, these guys use hand and arm signals to relieve each other so one can fly while the other one can rest. And they do this until they get back to their home base in Tolbrook. When they get over their home base, they tell the rest of the crewmen to jump out and parachute onto their base, which they do. And they also tell uh, Troupier, you need to jump as well. And he says, I cannot. The pilot is still on board, and I'm not going to leave him here. They launch another aircraft up there called My Princess, another B-17, to help coax him down. The problem is these guys have lost so much blood, and they're in such bad shape, they can't keep a constant airspeed at an altitude to hit the runway. They tell them, then go ahead and try to land it in a field elsewhere. And they do. All three die. They, the two live crewmen died because they were not willing to leave the injured comrade. And both men were given medals of honor. On the second day, again, we're going to launch about 800 bombers and 15 fighter groups and hit some aircraft factories and fields. We're going to lose 16 bombers and three fighters during this time. Uh, <coughs> for the most part, we have a number of raids uh, another number of victories uh, with regard to uh, the fighters. Again, we lose, the Germans lose 33 aircraft, but again, that's an inflated number. The next day, we got some problems. We got some weather that comes in. And what's happening is some of the bomb divisions have to be recalled. 
Curtis LeMay, who's in charge of the 3rd Bomb Division, has to tank his whole bomb division and bring them home. Some of the B-24s go out and they hit, they get all strung out over the European continent and some of them uh, are getting shot down because there's no fighter protection. Other bombers hit various objectives. Uh, some of them hit the wrong targets. They hit the cities of Nijmegen uh, and Arnhem in, in uh, uh, Holland, even though they think it's Germany. Um, <clears throat> the Germans are also inflating their numbers. They will claim that they shot down two B-17, but really what they're losing, they lose eight aircraft in that effort to lose, uh, to shoot down two B-17s. Um, so what you're seeing here are the bomber losses are around seven or eight percent in total. Uh, on the fourth day, on the 23rd of February, the 8th Air Force is soft in. They can't fly anywhere, but the 15th Air Force can. And they're gonna fly up the Adriatic, around the Alps, and start bombing aircraft factories in Austria. Uh, uh, in Austria. Uh, and they're gonna be relatively effective, but they're gonna lose 17 aircraft or 11% of the bomber force. They don't have fighter escort. On the fifth day, the Air Force, the Eighth Air Force is back into it. They're gonna attack Rostock without fighter escort and the clouds are gonna obscure the city or the target, but they're gonna bomb the city instead. This becomes common practice in the combined bomber offensive. Remember, we only kill the targets themselves, not people. It becomes standard practice that if you can't see your primary objective, go to your secondary objective. If you can't see that, hit the city associated with it. There must be something in there. That becomes standard practice. Also, think about this. You're on mission number 20. You gotta fly 25 missions, and you don't get credit for a mission until you drop your bomb. You have an incentive, right, to drop your bomb because you wanna go home. Okay? These are kind of the things that we tend to forget about with the bombing uh, offensive during this time. Uh, on the, uh, continued here on the fifth day, you can see the US is gonna claim about 38 kills. And for the entire day, the Air Force loses 49 bombers out of 746 effective sorties. What that means is you may have 800 planes take off. Some of them have engine problems and they come back. That's an ineffective sortie. Like I said, you want to go home. You want to do your 25 missions. You want to finish this thing. So again, we have about a 6.6 uh, uh, loss rate here during this time. Uh, they're going to attack Schweinfurt this day, which is a, one of those targets that was really hard to hit in 1943. But uh, what you're going to see here is a loss rate of about 4.6% on that rate, the rate here in February, as opposed to a 20% loss rate for the August 1943 raid. They lost 20% of the attacking force. On day six, the weather's going to hold out for one more day, and they're going to start hitting targets in the Regensburg area. And they're going to destroy about, uh, that, uh, a tractor that produces about one third of the ME 109 fleet. Uh, and this is going to be the highest rate uh, for any U.S. raid for losses over the Regensburg raid here. Okay. Um, by hitting Regensburg on this particular flight, German fighter production out of that factory is going to fall uh, from 435 aircraft in the month of January to 135 for the month of March, almost a 300% drop. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in uh, Augsburg, 30% of the buildings are damaged and production is going to go down about 35%. But 70% of the stored materials will be destroyed by the bomber. Okay. And continuing on here, uh, we're going to still launch bombers and fighters ad nauseum on this last day to kind of hit these, these targets and claim 26 Germans. So in aggregate, folks, what I've just been articulating to you for the past 20 minutes over these uh, past few days of the bombing offensive is this. We're going to lose about 266 heavies, 28 fighters, and right off a total of 299 bombers. Right off the beginning, it came back, it was so damaged, it never flew again. 2,600 U.S. Air Force air crew are lost. About a fifth of the U.S. Air Force, eighth Air Force, excuse me, is lost during this one week. Fairly significant number. But you're gonna drop almost the same amount of bombs in one week than the entire 8th Air Force did during 1943, the entire year. Cap Arnold likes this. Doesn't like the losses, don't get me wrong, but we're starting to launch bombers in mass. The overall, excuse me, the overall loss rate is around 6%, much better than the 10% we've been experiencing in 1943. It's still high, 
But the important thing here, folks, is that we're starting to tip the scale. The one thing the Germans cannot get involved in in the Second World War is that idea of material schlack. War of material because they cannot outproduce the Allies. They had this problem in the First World War. Guess what? They got the same problem in the Second World War. And here we're going to talk about the air war specifically. Look at the Luftwaffe numbers here. They're going to lose a third of their single engine fighters, a third of their single engine fighters, and 18% of its pilots. Think about the implication of how long it takes to train a skilled pilot. It's one thing to have a newly minted pilot, that's one thing, but to have a skilled pilot, a guy who's been around for a while, he's been flying for four or five years in a combat environment, and we're starting to lose 20% almost in one week? Think about the strategic implications for that. German fighter production is going to go down for a period of time. It's going to ramp back up, folks. It will. And the Germans are going to produce more aircraft in 1944 than they did in 1940, 1941. But here's your problem. Who's flying it? Those guys are dead. And so there's a lot of guys who the Army Air Corps is convinced that the Germans can't produce fighters anymore, but they do. And when they're going after the war and start looking through the records, they find out that actual aircraft production goes up during the combined bomber offensive. How the hell can that be? We bombed the crap out of them. It's because we made the assumption that German production capacity was at 100%. And it wasn't. There was plenty of slack in the German production capacity that they could produce more fighters during this time, even though it was harder even though they were killing people and bombing the, the factories themselves, they actually produced more. And so you can see here, the Germans are going to lose much of the buildings, but you can see here the machinery is at much lower levels. Now, there is a, an effect here that's, gonna, that's really going to hamstring the Germans. Because we're bombing their cities and their factories, what do you think a good response would be to that if I'm hitting this factory here? Move it, disperse it, and they will. They'll disperse a large part of their aviation industry. They'll take 29 factories and scatter them to 85 different sites. They're going to take their engine factories and move them to about 249 different sites. Okay, so now I got them all over the place. You can't hit it, but the problem with that is if I'm a German, now I got my airframe, but my engine is, is in Stuttgart. So how do I get my M109 fuselage to the engine factory over here in Stuttgart. There's a little bit of a problem here. And then what's going to happen in 1944, guess what the Americans are going to start bombing? Rail networks and rail networks. And so while I'm producing more stuff, the ability to get these parts together gets to be problematic for the Germans. And something else is going to happen in the summer of 1944. After D-Day, after we prep the beaches for the amphibious forces, the Army Air Force is going to go after a new target. Fuel. Go back to the pilot problem. I can't produce enough pilots. Oh, and now, by the way, you need fuel to train new fighter pilots. Don't have any. So the Germans are going to have to start harboring their resources. The tidal wave of material schlock in the air war is overcoming the Germans during this time. Um, you can see this is a clash of titans in the air. And here you have the 8th Air Force bomber losses during the spring of 1944. And you can see it goes to a peak of about 24.6 of the available bombers are going to be shot down. But then it's going to drop off appreciably. Why? Because the Germans can't keep up. German aircraft losses, you can see here. In the big week in February 1944, they're going to start increasing, and then they're going to start dropping off. In, uh, in January 1944, she lost, Germany lost 355 fighters. A week later, she lost 335. By the end of the month, she lost 661. By the 20th of February, she's losing 308. February, end of February, 545. March, 514. And by the end of March, 777 fighters. Now, she's producing more, but she's also losing more at the same time. During the same period in the spring of 1944, she's going to lose 
433 flyers, 341 are going to go missing, and 277 are wounded. In a three-day period, in one squadron of 25 pilots, they got five pilots killed, six wounded, two severely wounded. And the Germans are going to learn that as they were taking off, the Americans are now trolling the rendezvous sites for these fighter squadrons before they go after the bombers. And so they're trolling around waiting for the Luftwaffe to start man to getting itself up. And then they're going to go after the fighter bases themselves. So again, they're uh, trading the Luftwaffe while she's on the ground or while she's getting ready to attack the bombers before she actually gets up. Uh, in March, Luftwaffe is going to write off 56% write off of its single engine fighters. So when we look at this assessment here, we took some significant losses. The Germans take some significant losses. But what this starts, what this starts here in February 1944 is the attritional fight in the air that the Germans cannot compete with. There's a recognition that the existing doctrine needs to be revised. The fighters have to do what fighter pilots do best, go kill things, hunt them down, and kill them. And this idea of ultimate pursuit works out well for the fighters. Matter of fact, for the, the fighters themselves, remember a bomber's gonna cruise at about 175 knots ballpark figure, okay? The P-51 is going to have to stay with the bombers at least to get them there, right? And they'll have to zigzag over the top of them or do railroad tra or do a racing tracks around to stay with them, okay? And usually they're using up all their fuel. So what will happen is sometimes a replacement squadron will come in. That squadron will now return. But under the new ultimate pursuit tactic, before you go home, relieve squadron, go shoot stuff up. Go cause as much havoc on the European continent as possible. So think about this, your average P-51 pilot was like 19 or 20 years old, a little bit younger than the bomber pilot. You're flying a P-51 with 1,900 horsepower in you with 650 cows and you're told to go blow stuff up. I can't think of a better way to have a day. No, I'm just, just saying, I'm throwing that out there. Okay. On the strategic level, the Americans are able, and the Allies themselves can handle these losses because we're producing B-17s and P-51s at the cyclic rate. I think Willow Run is producing a B-24, like one an hour, something ridiculous like that, I forget what the production numbers are. The Germans, they can produce bits and pieces. The problem is, can they produce the pilots? Of course, they can't, okay? And this is the beginning of the end for the Luftwaffe. As you saw earlier, the bombing accuracy will go up because they're not getting harassed as much anymore. The guys can fly relatively uh, uh, unscathed over Germany by the time 1945. So what you see here with Operation Argument as this forgotten decisive battle, it begins the attrition of the Luftwaffe for the air war in Europe in 1944. And so with that, I think I am right on time. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, depends upon the the bomb configuration itself. Usually a B-17 can carry anywhere from six to seven tons worth of bombs. And you have 1,000 pounds, you have 500 pounders, you have incendiaries. Depends on the nature of the target. But for the most part, a 17 will be maxed out with about seven tons of bombs. And you throw on 10 crewmen with their machine guns and all the ammunition, they're going to start waiting this thing out. It depends upon the nature of the target, sir. One of the problems we have here in Europe uh, that's different from the Asian theater is that most European buildings are built out of brick and mortar, hard rock. In Asia, it's wooden paper. And incendiaries work great in wooden paper cities. It depends upon the nature of the target, so I, I can't give you a, a precise answer on that. But here's one thing that I, I think I can maybe answer your question on. You think about... Uh, a number of 500 pounders sitting in the bomb bay being delivered by 10 guys. And the amount of firepower that is inherent in those bombs compared to what 10 riflemen carry. You know, with 
firing you know, the, the Garand rifles. There's a certain, or there's an, an exponentially large amount of explosive capability in these 10 bombs than there are in 10 guys carrying rifles on the ground. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but this is one of the things that we see that's great about Air Force. It might be cheaper. Instead of having armored divisions and infantry guys, I buy a few bombers that carry this high explosive 10 bombs, and guess what? They can call all kinds of damage, as opposed to 10 guys carrying rifles. I don't think I answered your question, but it depends upon the nature of the target, sir. Yes, sir. Um, how much of the Luftwaffe was occupied on the Eastern Front against yeah. Russia? Yeah, that's a good question. This is one of the things that the Air Force will hang its hat on. Even on a combined bomber offensive, the results are equivocal. Uh, after the war comes out, uh, they'll do what's called the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. They'll do a, a very detailed study of the effects of this thing. And basically, it'll come out and go, it was a factor in the war, but it was not the factor. And the Army Air Force will go, you're full of crap. We were the factor. That's what they're going to say. Okay? And one of the things they're going to say is because we're doing this offensive, the guys on the Eastern Front, the Russians, they had to take so many resources, 88 millimeters and 109, to do home defense that that had a secondary and tertiary effect on the Eastern Front. That's going to be one of their arguments. But the Luftwaffe is basically stuck between Eastern Front, Western Front, and home defense. And it's about a third and a third and a third, but it depends on what stage of the war you're at. There's certainly more on the Eastern Front on a home defense than what you have in France. Uh, at any one given time, to, to answer your question, I'll give you about a 60-40 a, a split between the two on that because they're involved in a shooting war. And with all due, due deference to Band of Brothers and, and, and what we did in Normandy, the guts of the German war machine is destroyed on that Eastern Front. 400,000 Americans are killed in the Second World War. How many Soviet Union soldiers are killed or Soviet citizens? Yeah, 20 or 30, depending on which numbers you want to believe, because nobody knows what the numbers are. But millions of people were killed. So a proud 60-40 ballpark figure, sir. But again, it depends on which stage of the war you're in. Yes, sir. What role did this end to the Americans play during the East? Yeah, huge. Because remember, we assume that these vital centers exist. Well, somebody's got to tell me where they are. And are these guys really producing ME-109 engines? Maybe they're producing something else. Here's another problem. We're going to bomb Schweinfurt in, in August of 1943 because that's where they make ball bearings. We figure if we hit ball bearings, that means you can't make other uh, engines that produce things for tanks and aircraft. The problem is the Germans start diffusing their ball bearing production throughout Europe where they're occupied territories. And so that target isn't as important anymore, but we still think it is. And so some of our targeting methodologies are going to be faulty. But we're, we can only go with the intelligence that we have. But it is very important because I'm going to go after those vital centers exist, right? That's part of our doctrine. I need to know what those vital centers are. And of course, the Germans are going to start moving this stuff around. They're going to start diffusing this stuff. And that in itself is a whole scale effort to find out where this stuff exists. So it's in a very important part of this. Yes, sir. Suppose the impact of altitude on an engine says one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you're flying at 20,000 feet, the ambient air temperature is around negative 40. The B-17 is an unpressurized aircraft. That's why you see these guys wearing parkas. And underneath their parkas, they have an electronic heater suit as well, to provide them additional uh, warmth. When you get hit, the good thing about being at altitude is that the wound will freeze relatively quickly because it's exposed to the elements, which will help cauterize the uh, wound itself. Of course, when you get down to warmer altitudes, it'll start to unfreeze. One of the problems you have, too, is if you're wounded and you're not conscious, you put an oxygen mask on a guy. These early oxygen masks are not necessarily the most reliable thing, and it's very easy to get hypoxia because the mask either slides off the face or it gets stuck with ice or some other obstruction in there. And so somebody has to tend to these guys while you're making it back. And of course, there's no plasma, there's no blood, there's none of these things that are on the aircraft itself. And so at least the high temperatures can freeze the wound for a while, but you got to the body goes into shock and those other things that, that come into play. So it depends upon the nature of the wound and how far are you from a, a given mission or from your home base. And a lot of these guys will land someplace else because they know as soon as they see Great Britain, they can land and get uh, help for their, uh, their comrades. This gets to be a problem. And sometimes they'll, the guy will be hurt, they'll put a parachute on, push him out, hoping the Germans will find him and, and give him some aid. Um, but it, it is a significant issue. And for the most part, 
the Army Air Force uh, in disproportionate amount has more actual KIA than wounded personnel, like an infantry battalion, because either your plane went down, you know, or you made it back, you know, you see what I'm saying, uh, like that. Uh, I think it's a full third more gentlemen are killed in the Army Air Forces than in the ground forces because your plane went down or you, got, you, you didn't get wounded. So it does have a, a role to play in that. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, when, when you have, say, a, a, you, you have full strength and lose 15%, of the planes, how long does it take before they're replenished and bring them yeah. back to full strength? Good Which point. Uh, in 1943, that's a problem because America has not quite yet got its production capacity going. We're getting in there, but we're not there. By 44, next guy in, next bomber in. And planes are coming off the production line so fast in 44 and 45. Matter of fact, they're even not even painting them anymore. What's the point? We own the air, we're producing these things fast, just get them over there. That's why late in the war, you don't see B-17s that are painted anymore. They're just aluminum because we can produce these things so fast. Our training uh, pipeline is also in full gear. So you're getting new pipes coming in relatively quick by 44 and 45. It's not a problem for us as much as it is a huge problem for the Germans. Because material manpower, all those things are the merit of the great arsenal of democracy, as we well know. So later on in the war, it really is a war of force. Now, training these guys is a whole other matter. Getting them combat experience is a whole other matter. But qualified winged aviators. They're, they're showing up. Yes, sir. How rigid is the uh, flight rules for these bombers? Seem like they're flying into that flak box at a known altitude at a moving target. Uh, if you're in formation and there's a flak box, you're staying in formation. Can't they come in lower altitude? Well, you can come in at a lower altitude, but so can the flak. It can adjust as well. Um, again, the Germans know where the main targets are. And so you can try to move around them, but there's usually a flak farm somewhere else. They know where these main production facilities are. Uh, my office mate, actually, uh, at CGSC, his mother-in-law, no kidding, was a Luftwaffe flak sergeant <laughs> during this time. Uh, I, I, I was fortunate to interview her, and she says, yeah, we knew the routes. We knew you guys were coming. And she manned an 88-millimeter cannon around Berlin, and she says, we knew what the routes were. We knew when you guys were coming. We just fired over in that direction at a certain altitude. You know, so it was kind of hard to, to get around these things. And of course, by 43, the Germans are, are getting everybody they possibly can. Young teenage girls, i.e. my roommate's mother-in-law, young boys are manning these things. 88 millimeter cannons, shooting up 25 feet. Yes, sir. Uh, 1957, to uh, go into Lorient for liberty, mm -hmm. we had to go right past the German sub pins. Oh, yeah, OK. They weren't damaged at all. No, bounce, bounce, bounce right off of them. A absolutely. They, and that's one of the things that we learn is, you know, if it's got like 10 feet of concrete, there's, there's not much you're going to do to that. But again, we make an assumption that we could hit these targets and they're going to explode, but we find out that they don't. And the Germans are going to start producing stuff underground as a result of this. Uh, getting back to your flat question. Uh, in early 1943, the three, head of the 305th Bomb Group uh, is going to fly his first mission, and he finds out that their accuracy is really crappy because they're doing evasive maneuvers. And after a few missions, he tells his crewmen, look, we're going to fly straight and level on the IP, and nobody's moving. You're going to stay on target once you load it into the Norden bomb site. And Norden bomb site can fly the aircraft to the target with an autopilot. One of the crewmen st uh, stands up, and he says, sir, you're going to get us all killed. And the commander says, no, you won't, and I'll be leading the first plane. And he does, and they hit the target. And that becomes standard practice within the 8th Air Force. That commander was a young colonel by the name of Curtis LeMay. Yes, sir. Uh, how did the uh, B-61 compare to the Germans? The 109? Uh, yeah, the uh, 51 had firepower and range and maneuverability. The 109 was still a, a fairly good fighter, but what's the problem you're having? Quality of pilot. In the U.S. Air Force, you fly your 25 missions and you go home. If you're in the Luftwaffe, stay on, stay on. Now, some of these Luftwaffe pilots have 100 kills. There's one pilot that ends the war with 352 kills. He's flying on the Eastern Front, by the name of Eric Hartman. But what's happening is the attrition of qualified pilots. And as the stem of production and everything else comes into play, these guys don't have a chance. There's one Luftwaffe pilot, and this is a great quote. He says, every time I close the canopy in my 109, I feel like I'm closing my own coffin. But on par 
So 51 is still a little faster, has a better rate of climb, better roll rate than a 109. Remember, a 109 is designed in the 1930s. The 51 doesn't get designed until during the war. And when it first comes out, it's a pig. They put a new engine, it puts a Merlin engine in, this thing goes, wow, look at this thing. And so it outclasses the 109. The 109 can hold its own, but when you start putting in qualified pilots, guys have got lots of hours in there, the Germans are losing their qualified guys, again, you know, through attrition, they don't stand a chance in aggregate. So, yeah. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so you hit on the principle of distinction, uh, the international humanitarian legal principle, like making sure not to hit civilians. Yeah. Um, was the Air Force uh, one of the first people, group, uh, military force to incorporate this into their rules of engagement? Uh, no. Matter of fact, during the uh, American Civil War, you have balloons. And in some of the uh, lesser wars of the late 19th century, this idea of, hey, we can drop stuff from balloons. And even before the turn of the century, there was these ideas that, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to drop things on people, especially civilians, from aerial platforms. And so there are rules that are written. They're not obeyed, but there are rules that are written prior to the turn of the 20th century towards this end. Now, after the First World War, there are the Geneva Convention and there's the Commission of Jurists in 1923 will also outlaw the idea of hitting civilians and blah, blah, blah. There's lots of rules about this, okay? That will help drive American doctrine, but by the time 1945 rolls around, the gloves are off. And if you were here for my pitch on uh, the Tokyo Raid, you know, on March 9 and 10, 1945, we're going to kill 85,000 Germ or Japanese in one night. In one night. And so there are these ideas of humanitarian considerations, but after a while, they all go away. Secretary Stimson is very concerned about that topic. And he's going to write an e a e email. No, wait, email. He was going to write a letter. <laughs> I've actually seen the letter, so it wasn't an email. I actually saw the letter to Half Arnold in 1944, and he says, are we gonna outdo the Germans in atrocities with this bombing effort? Because he sees, but you know, front page of the news, you know, Berlin bombed, all these kinds of things like that. Uh, and Half Arnold will write back to him, and he'll say, we're in a shooting war, and now is not the time to get soft. And largely the American population during the war, it's not an issue. There are a few, there are some uh, peace activists out there, Vera Britain specifically, who will talk about America's massacre by bombing. And she'll write letters to the editor in uh, the New York Times, and overwhelmingly the response is, forget about it. The Germans have this coming to them. Even uh, the Archbishop of, uh, of New York <coughs> will tell Vera Britain basically, shut up. Yeah, this is the, you know, loses her uh, family or her brothers in the First World War. Yeah, big peace activist, and, and she's the one who's going to decry this stuff. But overwhelmingly, the U.S. response is, be quiet. In 1943, there's a survey done by um, Gallup, the Gallup poll, and it asked, you know, a, a set uh, sample of people if military leaders decided it's required to bomb important buildings or religious structures in the course of the war, would you approve it? 73% of Americans say, yeah, not a problem. The thing is, folks, that question's never asked again until after the atomic bomb is dropped and it's about, hey, should we drop the atomic bombs? And overwhelmingly, heck yeah, drop three, in, in, to a certain degree. Yes, sir. Yes, as, as an elementary school student, I love the P-38. How did it compare in performance yeah. to the P-51 and how many of them were produced as yeah. opposed? P-38s are removed from uh, the main force of 8th Fighter Command by January of, or January of 45, they're gone. They do not perform well at all. One of the reasons is they fly at the higher altitudes and the Allison engines in them, they tend to freeze up. Uh, they tend to have carburetor problems with the higher, uh, higher density altitudes. And so they, uh, a lot of pilots, when they get ready to go into combat, they start going to, they put the throttles up, one of the engines will conk out. Bad time to have an engine conk out. They are summarily removed from the 8th Fighter Command and they're pushed out to the Pacific where they do gangbusters below 10,000 feet. And, and of course, that's where we fight most of the Japanese is below 10,000 feet. But in Europe, they, they are largely loathed by 8th Fighter Command. Uh, the head of 8th Fighter Command keeps fighting off this idea that P-38s stink, 
but the pilots do not want to fly these things anymore because of the engine problems that they're having. And plus, it's a very difficult aircraft to fly in terms of getting it ready for combat, switching over to the various fuel tanks, and, uh, and getting more emergency power and those kind of, it's very complex. But the big problem is the conking out of the engine. It's a great design, it's a beautiful looking air, I'm with you, it's a beautiful looking airplane, but it can't handle the density altitudes of 20,000 feet that, that you have in the air. Yes, sir. Yeah, the Germans start pushing the 262s out around 1944. I think it's mid-1944. Um, you know, and if you watch the History Channel, you know, if Hitler made more jets, they would have won the war. No, they wouldn't have won the war, all right? The war is over, all right? There's always that Luftwaffe 46 fan club out there, you know, that the Germans would have won the war. No, th this here signals that the wave, the, the, a sea change. The war is over. Matter of fact, most Germans, you know, the war is over by 43. They just don't know it yet. You know, some of the higher up, yeah, this ain't going too well for it, all right? But even if they produce more Me 262s, okay, would have we lost more bombers? More yeah, probably, no doubt. But it wouldn't have changed the outcome here. It wouldn't have pushed the war into 46 or anything like that. It, there's too little, too late kind of a thing on that. Are they an impressive weapon? Absolutely. Head of their time, I got this. There's no question about that. But another two or three squadrons of 262s. And plus, here's another problem. The 262, the early jet, it's a beast to handle. And again, what are we running out of in Germany? Skilled pilots who can fly this thing. The 262 has their problem is if you throttle, if you push the throttle up too fast or recharge it too fast, the engine tends to flame out. And they're very vulnerable, as you can imagine, like any airplane, when they're landing. Well, guess what? The P-51s know that. And what they'll start doing is trolling around 262 bases, waiting for them to come in on short final. And the Germans actually have to take uh, FW-190s launch them before the 262s take off to play top cover for the 262s as they take off. And the same thing when they land. The Germans will paint these things with candy stripes on the bottom of them so the 262s can see that these are painted differently from the P-51s. They're, re they're really beautiful, that they're red with white candy stripes on the bottom of them. But the 262 is not a tide changer for the Germans. Again, History Channel will make you believe so. It's not. It will have a, a m more deaths. Yes, you will. You'll have a a higher attrition rate, but it's not going to change the tide of the war. Yes, sir? Did Werner Harrison's uh, plot for the War of the Ten Campaigns come out Yeah, that's a great question. There are books written about that. Um, it has to. In my opinion, now you're getting into the supposition, it has to. Uh, again, precision, daylight bombing, we're not going to do that. That's not what America does. But by 1945, there is no difference in the result between what the British did at night and what the Americans were doing. By 1945, again, as I told you, um, what's considered a target starts to grow. Just hit the city. That's a target. And a lot of times, what, if the crews can't find their targets, oh, there's a rail yard. Go after the rail yard. It's got to be some kind of military importance. And of course, rail yards are big, so rail yards are easy to hit. Um, and so the idea of doctrinally, no. The Air Force will say, no, we didn't, we're separate, we're distinct, but the reality is very different. Yes, sir. Uh, the Munster, which was 43, yes. the aiming point is that's the same as the Pico Battalion. Yeah, they use it as an aiming point, but again, they're trying to get the factory itself. Because what happens is there's usually what's called a walk back. Uh, you hit a particular target, boom, smoke comes up. Well, the problem is the other bombers behind you, so they can't quite see the target, so they have a tendency to release early, and what happens, the bombs go walk back. And so while the target's here, the follow-on groups and squadrons will, will actually bomb short for the most part. And this idea of bombing for 20,000 feet, it's problematic. It, it's, it's harder to do than we think. We think we have the technology with the Norden bomb site, but if you're at 20,000 feet, you might have a crosswind at 15,000 feet, and another crosswind at 10,000 feet. Absolutely, you know, with the jet stream and those kinds of things. Plus, put in the human factor on this thing. Your, your bombardier and your navigator, again, these guys are 20, 21 years old. They've been flying for about four or five hours. They've been shot at uh, by fighters and flak. They're cold as hell. You have to throw in the human factor. Fog, fear of a young man at this time. Yeah, I know we're all full of piss and vinegar when we're 20 years old. But these, some of these guys are downright scared. And they have good reason. And they have good reasons to be scared. Um, 
one of the, I, I can't think of a worse way to die, like some of these bottom, if you mentioned, sir, you were in one, the small airplane, relatively speaking, it's got a 103 foot wingspan, a B-17. And a lot of these times these things will get hit, the crew might be alive, but the plane will go into a spin. And those guys can't get out because the centrifugal force of the spin will pin these guys inside their fuselages, even though they're alive. And they have no recourse but to ride it in. And I can't think of a more horrible way to die knowing what's going to happen. There is one interesting story. This is actually a true story. There's a tail gunner in a B-17, <coughs> and the tail gets shot off of the B-17. He's completely separated from the B-17. He doesn't know. And the tail actually flutters all the way down to the ground, lands in some trees, and he walks out. That's a true story. I have another question. Okay, I've bored you enough with my geek love of airplanes and geek stuff. Uh, thanks for coming, and I appreciate it. I'll talk to you again. <laughs>